to come back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We went by to see him about a month ago in the front yard, you know. Hey! <laughs> mm-hmm. That our elderly would want to come back, yes. Yep. All right. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all that you are to us, and we thank you for your majesty, and we thank that you... Thank you that you are mighty in the midst of us um, in that Zechariah scripture, that you are mighty, Lord, and that you are in the midst of us, Father, within us and all around us. We thank you for all that your great hand does in spite of us, oh God. This march that uh, happened with uh, the believers at the uh, Washington Monument, Lord, and all the prayer that went up, we ask that you hear our cry, Lord, as a nation. And we pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on us and that you would stay this virus, Lord. The numbers would continue to decrease and that you would protect us, Lord, that the plague would not come nigh to our tent. And we thank you, Father, for delivering the righteous out of all trouble. We thank you, Father, for your blessings of mercy and all the things that you've been given to the those who love you, Lord, those who are called according to your purpose. I thank you for this lesson this morning and what it teaches us in forgiveness, Lord. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in each of our individual lives as you draw us closer to you. I pray for each of our individual families and family members, Lord, those who have cancer, those, Father, who are struggling with um, other different ailments, Lord, and surgeries that are coming up and Things, Lord, that uh, are physical difficulties in our lives. We pray for those with anxiety, Lord. Those that uh, will uh, begin to, to be disturbed within and overwhelmed, Lord. And you tell us that when we are overwhelmed, we can go to the rock that is higher than us. And Lord, we can plant our feet on you knowing that you work out all things and you do it in such a manner that it blesses not only uh, you and glorifies you, but it brings blessing to us as well. Help us, O oh God, uh, in, in raising children and all the things that come along with that, Father. I pray, Father, for our country, for our nation, for our military, for our upcoming elections, Lord, uh, on national, state, and local, and that you choose the king and that you would put in place in all levels, Lord, those that you would have... Uh, from the uh, president, this uh, Supreme Court appointee, um, all the way down to our local levels, Father, our state uh, senators and representatives and local state and representatives, Lord. Even in our community, Lord, we have elections and we pray for those. We thank you for what you're doing and how you're going to do it, Lord. And we do remember to pray for the families of the bereaved for this Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's family, Lord. And we just pray that you would be with um, others in our community, that loved ones have passed, you would be with them. Help us, Lord, through our difficulties. Make a path in the, the sea, Lord. Open up um, avenues of, of hope to give us breakthroughs. We, we need a breakthrough in some areas of our lives, Lord. And we just pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Ain't nothing like a little breakthrough when you're going through, you know, like you said, that storm the other night, um, even though it didn't let up. You know, I was safe and secure in my car, and I was sitting there remembering, you know, it doesn't conduct. If, if lightning hit my car, I've got rubber tires. I get, you know, you're going through all that in your head because, you know, it, the storms are bad, and storms are bad in our, our spiritual lives, and you have to stop and think about what uh, you know to be true. I knew it was true that I was safe and protected in my car. So I know that it's true that God delivers us out of all difficulties. He takes us through all of our troubles. So you just got to go back to what you know is true. And this lesson today is such a, a, a great lesson because everything in it is so true. Um, let's go back. Uh, we're supposed to be in Genesis 45, and we um, ended up with uh, uh, the, the brothers had to return to Canaan. 
and uh, he keeps Simeon, and then they, when they run out of food, they, have to, they know they have to come back, and they know they have to bring Benjamin. So just to fill in the, the uh, in-between story, um, when they'd eaten up the grain in, in chapter 43, you know, Jacob says, you've got to go back, and Judah said, you know, we can't go back until you, we bring the brother with us. And Israel, Jacob, was upset. Why would you deal so wrongly with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? And n- not even realizing that this is Joseph, which is just beautiful the whole time that God had worked that out. And again, in our day-to-day stuff that seems so hard and so difficult, and <clears throat> I don't know how y'all are, I just pray sometimes that God will just help me put one foot in front of the other. Lord, just help me make it through this class or help me make it through this obstacle or, uh, you know, whatever the day may bring. And, uh, you know, they explain it to him again. And uh, they they go ahead and bring him back and they present Benjamin and, and everything. So what happens? Go to 44. He um, gives them their grain, but he's he's going to trap them. Okay, so I'm going to do Genesis 44 real quick. He puts money in his brother's bags again, tells the steward to put, uh, fill it up, you know, fill up with grain, put their money back in the mouth of the sack, but put my silver cup in Benjamin's bag. Shoot. I didn't move. So when they did that, uh, you know, the brothers are caught in his trap. And, uh, you know, it, and it's, it says something about that was his divination's cup. So that was important to the Egyptians. Not uh, knowing, you know, did Joseph do divinations, that's a whole other story in itself. But I would like to tell you that uh, God had put no um, uh, practices against it because the word hadn't been written in Exodus that, you know, sorcery and mediums and all that were not doing any of that. So uh, if he did the practices of the culture that he lived in, anyway, they, it was his cup of divination. So it was an important cup. It was a silver cup. And then they said, we didn't do that. Far be it from your servants that we would do this. And I want you to start seeing in 44, before we get to 45, where he reveals himself. The brothers are showing that within the 20 years or so of selling Joseph into slavery and Joseph rising to, you know, to where he is, the brothers start this heart change. They show that they had a healthy trust in each other, and if they didn't trust each other, they would have immediately wondered which brother stole the cup. They might have been thinking, oh, that Simeon, or oh, that Reuben, or that Judah, you know, because we keep hearing their names coming to the forefront. And they said, whoever of your servants it's found, let him die, and we'll come back and be your slaves. So they were so confident that that none of them had the cup, that each of them were living lives that were um, the high road. They were living, you know, righteously. And they trusted each other so much that they declared that the thief should be killed and the rest of them would be Joseph's slaves. Isn't that cool that they came to that point in their life? Um, You know, do you want to talk about the psychology of that? Is Is this because they grew up? That they were they because they probably were middle aged at this point in time, and twenty years ago, you know, they were in their teens and their twenties, and their prefrontal cortexes hadn't developed yet. You know, you can you can argue all that all you want to, but trials and tribulations over the years of our lives they grow us up, they mature us. So those who are raising children and those are, you know that are, you, your kids are you know wherever they are and grandkids they will grow up. And they will, you know, but here's the kicker, as long as you've raised them in the Lord. Yeah, Proverbs 22, 6. (laughs) Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they're not going to depart from it. That is going to be so true. Did you notice I said that is going to be because some of my kids are still (laughs) trying to be trained up? Yes. So each of them let their sacks down, and uh, the steward was searching, and he began with the oldest and, uh, and then left off with the youngest, and guess where the cup was? Benjamin's sack. Because it's Joseph. They still haven't had an inkling. There's a part of me that wants to say, are you sure they didn't have an inkling? Has it not dawned on any of them yet? No, it hasn't. Or the scripture, you know, so I don't know. 
Um, so the reaction showed that uh, this was the worst thing imaginable. Because, oh my gracious, it's the kid from the wife that dad favored. But at this point, you notice that they had that healthy respect for their dad that they didn't have 20 years ago. It didn't bother them to sell, uh, well, they were going to kill Joseph. But then whenever, you know, as things turned out, it didn't bother them to sell him into slavery. They wanted to be done with him. And now um, Benjamin is sentenced um, to, uh, to a life of slavery. Um, the, the father's favorite son, the one he worried the most about. So he's going to, it's possible he's going to be uh, killed. And then they're all, you know, oh, it, it dawns on them, we're going to be slaves. We can't go back. This is it for us. How would you feel? How would you feel? What would you be thinking? I mean, your life would be going in front of you, you know, what's going to happen to our families at home, much less our dad. I mean, all this stuff, all the responsibilities. So every man, now notice what they did. Every man loaded his donkey and returned. It's like they faced whatever their future was with, a, a, to me, a little bit of a resignation. And I want to say slash trust, maybe. I don't know. Karen, what do you think? What we talked about last week, yeah, that guilty conscious thing. This is all coming on me because I'm reaping what I sowed with my brother. And all of them were guilty. Not one of them, you know, was, was unguilty. So, go ahead. Karen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure was. Half-brothers, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They were full brothers, and that's a thought to think about. Uh, there's more of a connection when you got the same mom and dad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Right. None of us stole it. What's going on? Now, Reuben's the eldest, and Simeon's the uh, second eldest. Judah's like the fourth or fifth boy. Well, Judah, uh, speaking of Judah, his, so Judah and his brothers come to Joseph's house, and uh, he's still there. They fell before him on the ground. Well, they've been doing that a lot. And Joseph said, what deed is this you've done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? That his um, predicting the future was uh, you know, very apparent to those in Egypt. And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? Now notice Judah's talking. Reuben and Simeon have just shut up. They've just, you know, well, and remember Simeon you know, had been in jail there for that time period. So you know what he's thinking? Doggone it, I am going back. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. That's a huge statement. God, and I'm in, in verse, uh, I'm in chapter 44, and um, let's see what verse am I in? Verse uh, 16. What shall we say and what shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also, with whom the cup was found. <clears throat> So, you know, it's like we're, we're busted. But he says, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. I'm just keeping Benjamin. Y'all go on back. Now, how did they react to that? Mm. I can't. You know, I, I, I can't go back without him. So look who steps up and intercedes. We can't go back without this boy. We've already been through this one time. You don't have any clue. You don't understand. 
Because, you know, there's no telling after Joseph never returned. Do you think the boys had to hear that often? Do you think that the father brought that uh, situation up every once in a while? Sure do miss Joseph. wonder what Joseph's doing now. Wow, if Joseph were here, he would have, yeah. you know. So you think about that. So Judah, now this is um, several Bible commentators, F.B. Meyer, um, Barnhouse, some of your famous, these are old 1800s guys. Um, no, F.B. Meyer, I'm sorry, is the 1900s guy. But uh, they said that this was like one of the most magnificent speeches that's in the entire Bible. That, that he says, so I'm going to read it to you. Judah comes near to him and says, Lord, let your servant speak a word in your Lord's hearing, and don't let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. Man, you're the head dog. I mean, you're just right up under him. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who was young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. There's that full brother thing, Miss Linda, you were saying, you know, that. And can you imagine what Joseph is hearing at this point? Because they have no clue. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I might set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. You gave us an ultimatum. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us. Then we will go down. We may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. So this, was Joe's, this is what Jacob kept clinging to. My kid's torn to pieces. My, you know how you'll go and play through in your mind if there's been a tragedy in your family, and you go back and you replay it in your mind, and we've all had tragedies in our families. And for his, he keeps seeing his kid torn to pieces by a wild animal. That's how he think his kid, thinks his kid died. So he replays that in his head because it's, that's the tragedy that, that life throws us that we don't ask for these things happen. And this is surely he's torn to pieces and I've not seen him since. Wonder what Joseph was thinking. Oh, how he didn't say anything, I have no idea. Because I would have, bull, you know, just overflowed. He did keep it cool. But again, that's Holy Spirit who had anointed Joseph for, for like Esther, for such a time as this. You can take that verse and it fits him there. For such a time as this, this kid was chosen to do what he did. And y'all have heard me say this over and over. You're chosen for your life. It's handpicked for you. Where you've been, what you've done, who you've come into contact with, the kids God gave you, all the extras God gave you. God might give you some more kids. He might give you this or that or you don't ever know. You've been chosen for it. And so Joseph was, he gets an Oscar Emmy, if anything, you know, not an Oscar Emmy. That's two different things. An Oscar or an Emmy. <laughs> for, and then he says, um, now, now, I lost my place. And, but if you take this one, thank you also for me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. You can't take this, child. It'll kill me. Now, therefore, when I come to you, to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us. He says that over and over, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, and Judah saying, I'm surety. I'm, you know, the, the bond. <laughs> I'm the one that's, you know, taking the place here. If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant, let me remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. Let me be the slave 
and let the lad go home with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? What's he offering here? He's offering himself. He, uh, F.B. Meyer said, in all literature, there's nothing more sorrowful than this appeal. This is a sorrowful appeal. Please take me. Please, you know. And how many times has, have you had a sick family member or a sick child and you've begged the Lord, please take me. Take me instead. Please don't do this to my child. Another, Leopold said, this is one of the most manliest, most straightforward speeches ever delivered by any man with such depth of feeling and sincerity of purpose that it stands unexcelled. Isn't that amazing? So um, he, he goes on and he offers himself in such a way. And I want you to think about this transformation that you see in these men. That's what I want you to see before we go to the forgiveness one. These men have changed. Have you seen family members changed? They go through tough times. They can change. Mr. Robert. Exactly. That was his whole point was to see this transformation. Sure. Right. They are. Could we take this as a lesson in our and how we treat our own families? that we do need to expect that there's transformation. And we can help work people work through that in, in, a, um, in a gracious way. Because he was very gracious about the whole thing. When he had the power to, boom, put him in prison. Amen. They are going to make mistakes. We just can't give up. No. He, they said, here comes that troublemaker. That dreamer, yeah. But yeah, when you get a little older and a little wiser, we do, you know, we know that it's going to happen. Because I have to go back and remember who I used to be. Oh, my gracious. Well, uh, you know, he's, he's offering to, uh, his life for his, his favored brother, and it's a sacrificial love, and it's another example of how they had transformed. Think about some other people. Moses, he was willing to offer himself for the salvation of Israel. Paul, Romans 9, he said, you know, uh, would it be me rather than my people? Uh, so sacrificial love is evidence of transformation. When you know that you would lay down your life for somebody, um, then you can step back and say, whoa, that's real. It's, I, I would never think that I would even feel that way. That's surprising that I even feel that way. So you, you, you know the Lord is real. Oh, isn't it? The ultimate example is Christ. You know, they didn't resent it when Benjamin was given that favored portion back in uh, Genesis 43 because he got more grain. Here's, and I'm just giving you some examples of their transformation. They trusted each other and didn't accuse each other of wrong when they uh, were accused of stealing the cup. You know, they didn't turn and say, did you do it? Did you do it? Oh, it was you. Oh, it was probably Simeon. No, it probably wasn't Simeon because he didn't want to go back to jail. Oh, it was probably Reuben trying to put it in. It's probably, anyway, so you can imagine the, the arguments that they had. And then they stuck together when the cup was found. They didn't abandon each other. They didn't abandon Benjamin like they abandoned Joseph. That's interesting. Uh, they humbled themselves and all, they loaded their donkeys back up. They all went back together. You know, it was the club. They were together in this thing. If it's one for all and all for one. And uh, they knew their predicament was the result of their sin against Joseph. I think that that kind of fell on them and they understood it. And they offered themselves as slaves to Egypt, not abandoning Benjamin. If, they were all, if Benjamin was going, they were all going. And they showed concern for how this was going to affect their dad. And then Judah was willing to be the substitutionary sacrifice for his brother out of love for um, Benjamin and out of love for his dad. So how interesting that these old boys had changed. But like uh, Robert said, it took 
it took all of these years and it took giving up Joseph to bring it all back around. So we do see that God can take our sin and he can work it around for good. Now that does not mean that we just go out and sin and hope God's going to work it out for good. Not a good idea. Well, let's go to our, our, our thing today, Genesis 45. So there's a, a, an emotional plea and, and Joseph's going to reveal himself. And we're looking at it in, verse, in chapter 45. Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. So Robert, he, he reaches that bullying point. The water's boiling over. And he tells everybody, make everyone go out from me so that no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. I want to see that when they do the DVD in heaven. Surely we get to see all of old stuff. Surely God's got it all where we can sit and go into a viewing room and we get to watch. I want to see the creation of the earth. I definitely want to see Noah's Ark. I definitely want to see when, you know, I don't know, just everything. All, I want to see it visually. I want to see when Joseph, you know, apparently took off a wig or wiped off the coal because they wore coal around their eyes very heavily. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, when that thing split, oh, are you kidding? Yeah, that, that one has to be good. Uh, or when the walls of Jericho fall. All of, I mean, there's so many things I can't wait to see. Y'all, when he revealed himself, just tell me what you think the look on their faces were. <laughs> well, it says uh, when he made known, uh, um, he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it and Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph, is dad still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer him because they were dismayed. That means terrified and afraid in the sense of that word. Sometimes dismayed means, oh, shoot, you know, I shouldn't have done that. This time it means terrified and, and afraid. And so when he, when he couldn't restrain himself and told everybody to leave, um, his emotion showed that he didn't cruelly manipulate his brothers. He just wanted to reconcile. Now the Joseph 20 years ago could not have reconciled. That fella that was probably in the prison uh, after Potiphar's wife accused him of raping her, uh, I'll bet you at that point, you know, he still had some anger and animosity. It took some time, just like it does for me and you, to work through stuff. We, it does. It just, it, 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 it just does. <laughs> some of y'all takes longer than others. And preacher always says, you know, I don't ever forget nothing. And I do. I, I can, I can uh, forget it to where I won't bring it up. But every once in a while, something triggers that thing. What is up with that? I'm so sorry. But uh, the older I've gotten, the better I've gotten. So, we, you know, we do you know, forget and leave. we press on. We leave that stuff behind. And I don't know, women have that emotional thing. The men, I mean, Rick forgets stuff. And he just totally forgives like that. He's so quick to forgive. He's amazing. And I'm not. I got to chew on that thing, you know. I got to pray on that thing. And then when the Lord gives me that scripture, I'm like, oh, okay. Are y'all like that, girls? Men, are y'all just, y'all just get over stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's still some that hang on to it, I know. Well, it, it's, it, he was directed by God in, in you know, to, to do the things that he did and arranged it the way that he arranged it to bring about the reconciliation. And so when he told him he was Joseph and he showed himself to them, um, it was an amazing time, an amazing thing, and uh, they were dismayed. Now, they were anticipating what? What were they waiting to happen? Punishment, anger, scolding, can't believe you did this to me. I've been waiting to get, you know. And you know how we say, uh, when I get a hold of her, boy, I'm going to tell her what I think. You know how we do. <coughs> So his manner of revelation, the way that he showed himself, and the total shock of learning that he was not only alive, but right in front of them, boy, they had to have picked up their jaws, just whoo. Um, and uh, then he says, come near to me. Come near to me. And that uh, implicates or implies that the brothers had cringed back in terror. <laughs> and uh, now there's Jewish legends out there that uh, the commentator that I use said that they were in such shock. This is a Jewish legend, which is only a legend, that their souls left their bodies. Isn't that crazy? That's, I, I wanted to read that to you because that's what it says right here. 
Uh, and then it was only a miracle of God that their souls came back. So, interesting. But uh, their dismay is uh, a shadow of what will happen when Jesus returns. And he comes to the... I'm ta- not talking about the rapture. I'm not talking about the harpezo. I'm talking about when he returns that second coming and set the, sets up the millennial kingdom. One foot straddles the, you know, uh, uh, Mount Zion. And boy of what the people will be like. They will be dismayed. They will be terrified and uh, cringing back. And uh, Zechariah says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Now think about what they did to Joseph. They will look on me whom they pierced and think about what happened to Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Wow. Now Joseph goes on, he gives a testimony here. He says, come near me, and let's read this. <clears throat> he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Don't be mad at yourselves. This was good news to them. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now you think about uh, the time periods that people have come against you, but the people that you were helping that might have been their kids or might have been you know, their loved ones, and then people come against you, you're just trying to preserve their life. You're just trying to take care of them, and then people come against you. And I'm talking about you know, from a teacher viewpoint where I've gotten... Oh, think about the bus supervisor over there. I mean, they're coming against you. You're trying to take care of their youngins. I'm trying to preserve life. Or you're taking care of people and you're doing things. And God sent you there to preserve life, to take care of the situation that it was. And he says, for these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. So we got five more years to go, boys. So what, uh, and then he says it again. God sent me before you to preserve, look at that word, preservation. Have you ever thought that you're going through something for the preservation of somebody who's watching you? I mean, you've got to take it that way. That's an amazing lesson right there. And that'll make you say, thank you, Lord. That, or, or it gives you purpose in what's the trial. That's what I like about this. This gives purpose to our trials. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance because they could have been assimilated into Canaan if the famine continued and they might have you know, uh, gotten and, and, and got, uh, packed up and moved somewhere else or they might have all split up. Simeon could have gone there and uh, you know, Asher would have taken his family over there and uh, you know, Judah might have gone this way and... Reuben might have gone that way. I mean, you just don't ever know what they could have done. And if they'd have split up, God's plans for the Jewish nation would have been none. Nothing. Wouldn't have happened. It's amazing. So now, and he says it again, it was not you who sent me. He says it twice. Don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me, God sent me. Don't, it was not you that sent me, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, because only God can make you uh, get that kind of a high command. Any kind of position you get, it wasn't you. Don't think it's you. It ain't you. It's God. And he knows that you can do the job, and he's already got the plan, and you're the one saying, make me smarter than I am, make me smarter than I am. Do, do y'all ever pray that? I know as a teacher, I do. Pl- please, Lord, make me smarter than I am, because I don't know all this stuff. Exactly. It wasn't hereditary like it was uh, in the culture. Absolutely. Yes, Tiffany. And we're praying for your mom. Yes, Lord. He made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph. Tell him the story. Go tell him the story. Now I'll tell you something. Shoo. I'd like to have been there whenever they told old Jacob that Joseph's alive. That's, that had to be an amazing moment. 
So all of Joseph's sorrows are for a purpose. All of your sorrows have a purpose, y'all. Everything's got a purpose. God used them to preserve his family, provided the conditions for it to become a nation. When they came back down to Egypt, that old Pharaoh gave them the land of Goshen. It was the best pasture land in Egypt. Now, I want to to point another one out that we looked at last week in in 43, uh, and I'll get to it in just a minute. God's made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there's still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin... See that it is my mouth that speaks to you, so you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Remember we talked in the uh, previous lesson when we started this. It's about three and, a, three and a little bit of weeks to get there and then to get them ready and come back. But not only that, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin weeps on his neck. Look at that family reunion. I like to think that's going to happen when I get to heaven. I don't know. Can't come back and tell you. That there's just that reunion. And I know that, you know, we have a different relationship in heaven. I get that. But this is so beautiful. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. They had a wonderful reconnection. And after that, his brothers talked with him. So they finally kind of went back to that sibling. You know how it is when you have reunions. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying Joseph's brothers come and please Pharaoh and his servants. And look what Pharaoh tells him to do. Now this is amazing to me. Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best land of Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. The ruler said that. You get the fat of the land. Now you're commanded to do this. Now listen, take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Take carts and go get them. And don't be concerned about your goods for all the best of the land of Egypt is yours. All right, and here's that piece I wanted to... Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command. He gave them provisions for their journey. There it is again, Jesus taking care of us. And he gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. To Benjamin, of course, he gives a little bit more, and nobody said anything. Nobody griped and complained that he got 300 pieces of silver and five garments. And he sent these to his father, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. Do you notice he gave them um, partners, ten males, ten females, so that they could reproduce? I mean, there's so much in this. Grain, bread, food. So he sent his brothers away and they departed and he said to them, uh, see that you do not become troubled along the way. But here I want you to see that he gave them, there it is, everything for the journey. Now when they uh, ended up in Canaan, you might as well have said they they flew in on uh, jumbo jets when they uh, slid into Canaan there. They came into the best of the best, best of the best. And everybody around in Canaan would have known, wow, that stuff's from Egypt, because none of them had that kind of stuff. Nobody had the iron uh, chariots and, and carts that they would have had, and the trappings and the decorations. These things would have been beautifully displayed, because it shows the riches and the glories. It was from Pharaoh's own stables. 